parables are they're kind of challenging, I think. So many times you read a parable and you end up scratching your head a couple of times. And, and I always feel like if you think you got the parable the first time that you really need to go back and reread it a couple more times. Because parables take us by surprise. They, they never go the way we think they'll go. They, they kind of will be going along and you're like, okay, I can follow this. This makes sense. This is logical. This is, this is easy for me to understand. But then always at some point in each parable, there comes a twist. The, the, something happens that just, you're like, why did this happen? And the whole parable rests on this one moment. Because parables point to the unexpected. And parables teach us about God. And parables show us the nature and the characteristic of who God is. And what that means for the church. And so as parables teach us about who God is, we learn something. That God does the unexpected. That God works in mysterious ways amongst us. And that God takes the way the world thinks and so often turns it upside down. That the way the world tells us to live, that the parables challenge that and provide an alternative, a different way, a different way to view the world. And today this parable has a twist in it. And it comes at the moment when the landowner starts to hand out the daily wages. And, and everything up to this point in the parable has been, I guess you could say, somewhat normal. That, like ancient Israel, there was always a courtyard, a marketplace, where the laborers would come and gather in the morning, praying and hoping that they would find work for the day. And that this wasn't stable work that was... Um, something that they expected, rather it was kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And that receiving a daily wage would be good for a day, maybe two days, if you really watched what you bought. But they weren't living a life of stability or a, a life of knowing that everything was going to be okay in a week or two or three weeks. Very much so like the world we live in this day, that we live in uncertain times. And so when God talks about the economy and about working, I think we, especially in this day and age, kind of perk up and listen. And so we, we find a landowner who goes out and he seeks to employ these people who are looking for work. And I can't imagine the disappointment on the faces of those who did not find work, who realized there was another day in which they could not return home with food to eat. It was another day in which the bare minimal had not been reached. And so I imagine they sat in that courtyard, as the gospel teaches us, idle, because they did not want to return home. They did not want to go home and to face the family and to say, I'm sorry. I was chosen unworthy to be a worker this day. And then I think that they must have had great surprise when they saw the landowner come a second time. To say, hey, why don't you come and work? I found that we have more work to do than we have workers. So will you come and help us? And that this doesn't happen just one time, not two times, three times, but the landowner comes four times inviting people to come and to work in the harvest. And the twist comes, though, when the payment is to be given. And it's not the first who have been working all day. It's not, not those who have been laboring the hardest, who, who have uh, really taken on the heat of the day. And, and I guess as we're leaving summer, and, and the gospel said the scorching heat, I think we can resonate with the scorching heat, resonate with doing work outside and how exhausted they had to be. And, and so they don't get paid for it. And they see the last come up. These people probably have not even broken a sweat. It's about 5 o'clock. You imagine the sun goes down around 6 or 7. And so they get paid a denarius, the daily wage. And immediately they're probably thinking, okay, if they're getting a denarius and they work 15 minutes, imagine what I'm going to get. I've been doing this for 12 hours today. This is, this is going to be great. I'm going to be able to buy this, this, and this. And so they go up with, with eager anticipation of receiving the best payday that they've ever had. And the landowner hands them 
the usual daily wage, the same thing that the person who began at 5 o'clock received. I don't know about you, but growing up, I would, uh, I remember going Christmas shopping with my parents, and I always enjoyed going Christmas shopping with my parents for my sister, because I would see what she's getting, and then I would start thinking, well, if she's getting this, this, and this, then surely I'm going to be getting this, this, and this. And I don't know if you ever, uh, I would set up these great, like, assumptions, and I would, like, have these dreams about what I was getting, and, and I would come down on Christmas morning. And sometimes I would assume stuff that didn't come true. And I don't know about you, but when your assumptions don't come true, it, it is, uh, it's not a good feeling. And so these workers have the same kind of assumption. that They, they think that they, they are worth more, that they think that what they have done is worthy of not what someone who just barely showed up, who didn't do anything, received. But God says no, that the first shall receive the same as the last. And in our world, it's logical to think that the last workers would not receive as much as the first. But we find out that the kingdom of heaven does not look like our world looks. Rather, the kingdom of heaven is unexpected. And what is so unexpected about it is the abundance of God's generosity. That God is so much more generous than we could ever ask or imagine. That God is more willing to give than we are to receive. And that in this parable, we, we kind of get a glimpse of the nature of God. And we see that God looks at all of us the same. That God is pleased with us being here this day. But that God loves each and every one of us. And God loves those who have not yet come to know the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Especially as a pastor, you, you think maybe, you know, if we come to church every Sunday, that, that maybe that will gain us more favor in the sight of God. Or, or if we do this and this and this. But God loves us. He loves each one of us more than we could ever imagine. And I think that's awesome. That, that, that this parable is showing that we're all equal before God's eyes. And that, that he doesn't look at us lowly, but rather he looks at us thinking that we can do so much through him. And he thinks of us as a cherished jewel, the greatest, the greatest jewel that we could ever imagine. And that his love is so great that he can love each one of us that much and not diminish his love for another one of his children. But this question of generosity and of grace kind of, I think, is hard for, for people and hard for us to think about if we come to church every Sunday and then we see someone on their deathbed. And I had a conversation a couple of days ago talking about this, that there's this person on their deathbed and they haven't been a good person. Maybe they were terrible to their family. Maybe they were a ruthless businessman that put other people out of business. Maybe they were greedy. Maybe they were racist. Maybe they were just a terrible person that you avoided. That they didn't know how to love. They didn't even know that they were loved. And then, in the last hour of their life, as they're sitting on their bed, all of a sudden they realize something. And you know what? God loves me. God loves me more than I could imagine. And I haven't done anything to deserve this love. I, it, as people are on their deathbed, they become very reflective. And he realizes, I've been a really big you-know-what. But he experiences God's love, and he asks for repentance and grace and offers his life over to God. And so does God love this person on their deathbed as much as the guy who comes to church every Sunday, who spends his whole life pouring out his heart into the mission of God's kingdom. Who uses every gift and every grace that God has given, up, given him to help make the church a place. Can these two people, the guy who converted on his deathbed and the guy who devotes his whole life, actually receive the same reward that God has for us? The gift of eternal and abundant 
and wonderful life in heaven? And the answer is yes. That God came in the flesh so that each person might be able to taste eternal life. But there is something that those laborers, especially the first, did not get that day. And what it is, is there is joy in serving. That there is joy in working, that there is joy in going out and inviting people. And I think so often this parable is read that God is the land owner. But I want to tell you today that really, in my opinion, the land owner is the church. And if we think about that, we have been given a great vineyard to care for. If we think about it, God has placed us here in northern Mount Pleasant to care for this community, to care for the needs of this community, not only those who are hungry, those who do not have shelter, those who are widowed and who are orphaned, but God has called us to care for the spiritual needs. And so we are called to go out and to invite people to come. And we are called to teach them that whenever you come in these doors, no matter if you have been in church since the day you were born, or if you've just come to church for the first time in your life, that God loves you the same, that God has the same gift for you, and that we don't look down on you for what you might have done, because we know that God is concerned with our future. And God does not look in the past, but rather God looks to the future to see how God can take us and can use us. And so as the church, we're called to be a people who invite others to come and see that we all have the same reward, the same gift, and that is abundant and eternal life in Jesus Christ. And that the good news comes that the person on their deathbed and the person who has served God all of their life, that they will spend eternity in the new heaven, in the new earth, that God will create one day when Jesus comes again. And so as a church, I say that we go out and we invite people to come and to work with us because God has a great vision for us. God hopes and dreams that we can take this part of the world that he has given us and that we can go out and that we can bring more workers in because there is more work to do that God is not finished with us. And this day, we are celebrating and we are rejoicing in what God has done because we have two couples who will be joining the church in a few minutes. And they are saying, yes, I am committing my gifts, my graces, my service, my prayers, my presence, and my witness to this community. That I am committing to be here, to be in faithful participation with the ministries here. Because we recognize that there is a whole lot that needs to be done in this world. And we recognize that people are looking for work. That people do not have things to do. And we need to teach them that through the church, that God will do abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. That God's spirit is alive and present here. And why does the church exist? The church exists for only one purpose. It doesn't exist to be a place where you come for fellowship. That's not its sole purpose. It doesn't exist to be a place where you come and worship, even though that's a part of the life of the church. The church exists to change the world. And so as they join the church here today, they are committing their life to changing the world for the glory of God. And as we look at this parable, we see that we are called to go out and to invite others to change the world because God wants all of God's children in participation with the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.